you talk about your garage, you say it's the more money than brains club. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> You've got steam, electric trucks, race cars, supercars, military vehicles. You said once you buy the story as much yeah. as you buy the car. Yeah, the story is, is usually what you wind up buying. Uh, I mean, the classic example of that was I've got a 67 Chrysler Imperial, LeBaron Coupe or Coupe, whatever they call it, this dude, with the dual air conditioning. It's not really my kind of car, but I, I get a call. Like, Jay Leno, my name is Pumpkin. P Pumpkin was his name. And he was like 93 years old. He said, I can't drive anymore, but I've got a 67 Chrysler Imperial. I bought brand new. I want to sell it to you. And I said, well, all right. Well, how much you want for it? I want $16,000. And I, that was a lot of money. But I said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I'm not really looking. For, uh, you know, I was just trying to kind of hem and haw. He goes, no, you got to see it. I'm a one on a car. He said, I've had it serviced by a guy from Chrysler who come to my house every month to service the car, to check it out. I, I said, well, that sounds interesting. I said, where do you live? Sunset Boulevard, Beverly Hills. I go, oh, he's like two miles from my house. I go, all right, what's the number? I'm hoping it would be like San Francisco, someplace where I couldn't get to. <laughs> right. I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll drive down there. So I, I drive down. And, you know, I hit the gate and the gate opens, you know, just like the movie Sunset Boulevard. You know, I, as I pull up, I see him. He's got a smoking jacket and an ascot. And he's got the white hair. He's got another white hair guy with him. Jay, this is my mechanic from Chrysler. He wants to retire. He's 72 years old now. Uh, I said, let's take a look at the car. He goes, Get, bring the car on the ground. Let me show you around the house. So he, he takes me in this house. And he was a movie producer. And he made... African-American films for African-American audiences. And he had the black James Bond and the black Gene Autry. And these were real movies. They weren't just, you know, step and fetch a comedy thing. I mean, serious films for when back in the days when, you know, theaters were segregated, that kind of thing. And he was, and he, and he paid them well. And, he, you know, it was, wasn't some horrible thing. Uh, they were his actors and he, he did all these movies. And his house looked like a brand new 1948 house inside, you know, with the old, kind of furniture and old lamps and everything. And then we're in the living room and I see a picture, it's a beautiful woman. I go, who's that? Oh, that's my wife. I said, well, she's very beautiful. He says, you want to meet her? I said, yeah, sure. So we go to the bedroom door. <laughs> he knocks on the bedroom door. She goes, hello, who is it? It's, it's me, honey. I got Jay Leno here. He wants to say hello. She goes, well, I, I can't come out right now. And then he says to me, she doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because the picture looked like she was 19. This had to be the 40. And I said, oh, OK. I said, well, I'll catch you next time. I'll see you later, Jay. OK, fine. OK. <laughs> so then we go outside. And now the car is out in the garage. And it's beautiful. It's a two-door coupe, just like the one Mr. Drysdale drove in the Beverly Hill building. So same color and everything, you know. So he's telling me about the car. And then he says, now, if you buy the car, you got to take all this other crap. And he opens the two doors next to it. And he's got. Spare bumpers, spare fenders, extra windshield wiper. He bought everything he needed in case the car was ever damaged. <laughs> well, okay, well, now I have to buy this car. Right. You know, so I, I have to buy it. So <laughs> I bought it. it, it I still Parts have and it. all. <laughs> and 144,000 miles on it. Runs like a top. You put the dual air conditioners in it. It actually snows in this car. <laughs> the air blows in the back of the front. I mean, you're freezing in seconds. <laughs> I mean, it's a complete absence of road feel, and, it, and it's a great car, and it was just such a fun story, you know? Those, those kind of things are interesting. You're, you have another storied vehicle in your collection, the Duesenberg, that had two previous owners, 1928, that had a heck of a story around it, too. Well, Tell every, me about the, the story that came from the GI. Well, every Duesenberg has a story. Yeah. Uh, my Duesenberg, I, I, I've got a LeBaron barrel side. And it's the first, uh, it sounds silly, the first Duesenberg I bought, but it was. And uh, what happened was, well, uh, uh, before I get to that, the original owner was a guy named William Ashton. He got the car when he was 17 years old. His grandfather uh, had a bunch of stock and he gave it to his grandson. And he and the grandfather cashed the stock in, went down and bought this Duesenberg in 19... Uh, 29 for seventeen thousand dollars when they drove it home the kid's father the grandfather's son just hit the roof threw them both out of the house you idiots you threw your money away well two months later the stock market crashed 
the stock was useless, but he had the car. And he had the car up until the late 40s. Then what happened was uh, the car got sold to a gentleman who was one of the first GIs into Berlin. And he and his troop of guys raided a bunch of those safety deposit box, cracked them open, took the diamonds, the jewels, da, 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 bought an old motorcycle, hit all the diamonds and jewels in the frame of the motorcycle, sealed it up, left it in Germany. Then two years later, they went to Germany as tourists. Oh, and bought a motorcycle, brought it back, cut the frame out, dumped the diamonds out, and bought a huge estate in Connecticut, and then bought the Duesenberg. Then this guy got despondent over a woman, drove the Duesenberg into the garage, shut the door, let it run, and asphyxiated himself. Mm. Now the car sat from 1950 about to about 1988, still untouched with only 42,000 miles on it. And his brother owned the car, but his brother would not sell the car to anyone who knew the story because Duesenberg, like, hey, I'm sorry to hear about your brother killing himself in the car. We want to buy it. No, no, he wouldn't sell it. So I'm at a car show. And I'm walking around, I see this old guy and I start talking to him. He mentions Duesenberg. I knew some Duesenberg facts and he seemed impressed with that. He said, would you ever want to buy one? I said, I'd love to buy Duesenberg. You can't find them though. He goes, I've got one for sale. I'm thinking, all right. So I, I bought it from him, never knowing the story. It wasn't until years later that I found out. Wow. But you know, the funny thing was the car had been sitting since 1948 until 1988. So obviously took it back. I gave that one to, we didn't do that. We gave that to Randy E. May. He's one of the premier Duesenberg stores. So now the car is perfect. It's Pebble Beach. We won Pebble Beach, the class with it and all this. And Nick, the guy I got it from, I bring him out to go for a ride. In it. And he says, uh, step on the brakes. Uh, you know, step on these car stops. Stops good? Because, you know, I, I, I did those brakes before I put it in the garage. I go, really? <laughs> really? I mean, I didn't have the heart to tell him. <laughs> Like, oh, well, I said, well, you did a good job because it's stuff. He goes, yeah, oh, yeah, did we, we bled them and we made sure that, oh, good. <laughs> I mean, we, we had every piece off that car. Every Tore that thing apart. Yeah, but it was just, it just, yeah. just funny, yeah.